don't just stick with the people who you know the best. Expand your network because that's where you're going to bear the most fruit in learning about an industry, figuring out if you're a good fit, having someone not hesitate to tell you the unvarnished truth because, frankly, they don't know you that well. Welcome to Career Relaunch, the podcast focused on helping you create a more fulfilling career. My name is Joseph Liu, and I'm here to help you gain the clarity, confidence, and courage to overcome the challenges of making changes to your career so you can do more meaningful work and enjoy your professional life. In each episode, I feature people who have stepped off the beaten path to reinvent their careers and successfully make a major career change. We talk through their unique personal stories, the challenges they overcame, and the lessons they learned along the way to help you take your own brave steps to improve your career and life. Today, my guest is going to explain how he relaunched his career from being a change management consultant to talent brand strategist. We'll discuss the importance of expanding your network and why you can't force yourself to like a job that's not right. Afterwards, during today's Mental Fuel, I'll explain how I maintain my own professional network. Today, I'm speaking with Aaron Fung, a talent brand strategist at LinkedIn. Before he landed at LinkedIn, he spent 13 years trying to figure out what he wanted to do. That journey took him from financial services to nonprofit to consulting jobs to an MBA in human and organizational performance from Vanderbilt University's Owen Graduate School of Management. He finally discovered his dream job at LinkedIn, where he now helps companies develop and enhance their talent brands to recruit the best candidates in the world. And in his spare time, he also runs a blog called Go See the World, which is dedicated to travel and his mother who recently passed away. Now, Aaron and I go way back after crossing paths at a networking event in San Francisco back in 2009 when I still lived out there. And I hope you really enjoy hearing about how his career has evolved over the years. If you want to learn more about Aaron, you can go to careerrelaunch.net slash 35. Aaron spoke with me from San Francisco. So when we recently reconnected, Aaron, you mentioned to me that you went on a 13-year journey to figure out what you wanted to do. So I want to touch on some of the major pivot points that you went through along the way, but can you just start by telling me what you're focused on right now in your career and your life? About five months or so ago, I started working at LinkedIn, and my job is I get to help companies figure out how to best tell their professional story. So a lot of times I meet with heads of HR or heads of talent acquisition, and I try to figure out, you know, what kind of stories are they looking to tell about what it's like to work in these companies? You know, I really love my job because I get to talk to a lot of different people and a lot of different companies. And uh, the stories are always incredibly different and occasionally very compelling. Okay. So I want to come back to the work that you're doing at LinkedIn toward the end, but I want to also go back in time a little bit here because I know you've got a very interesting career trajectory. And can you just take me back to the moment before you started your role there at LinkedIn? What was going on for you and what was happening for you at that time in your career? The four years prior to coming to LinkedIn, I'd spent in consulting roles. So I got to see a lot of different types of projects and jobs. And I was primarily focused in the organizational transformation kind of space. Each project kind of got me closer to what I inherently knew I enjoyed doing. There was something about change management that was interesting, but I don't think was ultimately my passion. I happened to have a few very strong mentors and advisors in my life, several of whom had counseled me to consider looking at recruiting. And, you know, I worked on a project for a very large technology company working with their global talent acquisition team. And within the first two months of being there, I said, this is the place I need to be, this kind of work. Finding exactly where that was and exactly what I was doing took me about another year after that. But, uh, you know, I kind of knew that the subject of working with people, recruiting the best people into a company and helping people to do that more effectively was something I love to do. Was there a particular reason why you decided to not just stay at that consulting firm and continue doing that sort of work? In my line of work doing sort of talent projects, you don't know when the project's going to end and where the next one's going to be. Because a lot of my friends in various companies had imparted some wisdom to me, which is that talent projects tend to be very few and far between. A lot of the time, people bring it in-house. They'll have an internal talent strategy team to do this work. So I knew I wanted to be doing this thing full time and not have it be kind of coming and going. And I was very lucky to just kind of stumble upon the, the role I'm in now. What ultimately made you decide to make the shift from working in consulting into your current role as a talent brand strategist at LinkedIn? Over the years, as I've talked to people in various companies, I knew pretty quickly whether it was going to be a good fit for me or not. I've never had one reason to doubt that LinkedIn was going to be a good fit because 
at its core, it's about getting people connected to jobs, to economic opportunity. The people I met kind of backed that up. As I learned more about what the team was doing, I said, this is what I want to be doing. It was almost as if it was effortless. I didn't really need to explain why. It just seemed like it was a good fit and everything clicked. The analogy I draw is, you know, when you meet someone for the first time and you know you're going to be friends or you know that, uh, you know, this person is destined to be, uh, you know, your spouse or partner. It's almost inexplicable, but it, it was a just immediate match. So as I'm hearing you talk about this, Aaron, one of the things that's running through my head is, wow, this seems like such a great match for your interests and what you're looking to do. And yet, I know when we spoke before, it took you a little time to get here to this point. Can you go back in time a little further then and maybe explain to me what you were doing before this point? And I'm thinking of even going all the way back to your time in the financial services before business school. I graduated from college in 2004, majored in business. And because I had taken a few classes in, in finance, I thought I was destined to be an investment manager or financial analyst. And I spent the first four and a half years of my career working in wealth management sales because I happened into a job. I enjoyed what I was studying. I enjoyed the research that I was doing. But it was kind of a, a misguided effort. It was kind of like the first person you become friends with, you think that's how all your future friends have to be. And it was my second or third year out of school. I had a chance to do some work in the training and development space. Loved it. And I knew I loved working with people as well as you know teaching them what I, something I knew about, which in this case was wealth management analytics. And it started me down this path of thinking, like, are there other applications beyond just being a salesman or managing assets? And I went to work for a nonprofit that did leadership development programs for Asian professionals in corporate America. And it was completely different than any of my work in financial services because it was a nonprofit. This was just at the start of 2009, so right as the, the financial crisis was kind of coming to a head. And I started thinking a lot about what are the activities that I really enjoy doing or that I do well, or ideally where the two of those cross. And I decided to go back to business school because I knew I had this interest in organizational behavior. I knew HR could be one application, but I didn't know exactly how. And that's what led me to study human and organizational performance at Vanderbilt. And the funny thing is, despite all my goals of not going back to a job in finance, I took an internship and I took a full-time job in financial services again, uh, for which uh, my friends gave me a lot of hell. Now, let's, let's just pause right there, because I think that was really interesting when I was reading back over your career history. It's like you go to business school, and I work with a lot of business schools, and I know a lot of times people go to business school because they want to make a career change. And yet, in your case, it sounds like you fell back into the thing that you were trying to leave behind. Can you just explain what your mentality was and why you think that happened? So I think on paper, my background was a really good fit for financial services. And I happened to meet a managing director at Credit Suisse who wound up becoming a good mentor of mine and, and you know, really coached me and coached me towards the, that role. And I didn't have, I think, the courage to say no to an internship that I knew fairly well or was familiar with. And so instead of holding out for something that would have pushed me or forced me into a different path, I decided to go down the path of least resistance. And I had a great experience. I did really well in the internship, enough to get a, a full-time offer, which I then took. But as I explained to people now, I, I basically followed the money. And in the long term, it was not the right decision because I got to the job, was there for about maybe six months or so, and then suddenly realized that I had taken a job that I didn't necessarily need to go back to school to go into. I, I basically had not taken advantage of the fact that I'd been in this fantastic school and could have gone down all these different other paths that I was considering. Like I had an internship interview at a casino. I could have gone to work for General Electric or in a marketing role for a technology company or something else outside of my wheelhouse. And I basically ignored all of those to follow something that was, for lack of a better word, comfortable. That was probably the biggest uh, humbling learning moment of my life was that six months after I graduated. I know you eventually moved on from that banking role. What allowed you to ultimately get over the idea that, okay, there's good money in this industry. It fits very neatly into the career trajectory I had. How did you ultimately end up being able to walk away from that? 
I mean, I think it was two things. I think it was this nagging feeling that I was just not a good fit for the financial services world, at least for selling wealth management products. It just, it never felt like a place where I was either immediately successful or just that I was a natural fit. And I think that coupled with the conversations I was having with some of my classmates and peers who worked in the organizational effectiveness or transformation world kind of led me to think that that was the path I should have gone down in the first place. At the end of the day, it was really just the sponsorship of one senior mentor of mine who had become a director at Deloitte. And she was my advocate, my sponsor. She was the one who put my resume near the top of the pile to be considered just even for an interview. And that's ultimately how I was able to leave. What do you think was surprising about that transition for you? I think that my relationship with her at the time was good, but I didn't quite realize the strength of her commitment to me and her willingness to stick her neck out for my candidacy. And I think that's probably the biggest lesson I've learned over the last five years is that what you perceive to be a weak connection or what could really be a weak connection could actually be the most powerful in that you know, you're asking for help and people in amazing roles or, or places has seemingly been willing to help me at every step of my career. That's something I've been very fortunate to have received. Yeah, that's interesting because I think their perception or the presumption is that you're going to get some promising lead from someone that you know really well. But it sounds like what you're saying is that even these weaker connections can be incredibly fruitful. I know I make this mistake and sometimes don't put enough weight into those peripheral relationships. That's absolutely right. I think that, in fact, if your listeners are trying to think about career changes, my advice is don't just stick with the people who you know the best or who have the strongest relationships with you. Expand your network because I think that's where you're going to bear the most fruit in learning about an industry, figuring out if you're a good fit, uh, having someone you know not hesitate to tell you the unvarnished truth because, frankly, they don't know you that well. So they're not afraid to tell you what they're thinking. In your role, I know that you must probably see a lot of different people who are navigating career change. What do you think is the hardest part about making a career change, having been through a couple yourself? It's a couple of things. One, loyalty to your existing company or your existing job, because you, you don't want to do wrong by anyone and you don't want to leave anyone else in the lurch, which I completely agree with. I think it's also partly just a fear of what leaving stability looks like. I was just talking to a friend of mine last week about this, and, and her great, greatest concern was not having something stable or not being able to do the thing that she wants to do. But you know, I asked her, well, what's your alternative? If your alternative is sticking with something that you know fundamentally is not going to work for you, whether it's in the short term or long term. Her concerns were exactly what I felt for you know, those several years when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, which is you shouldn't have to explain why it's a good fit. It should just be a fantastic fit. And I mean that on a few levels. I mean, the work you do, the people you're working with, the company you work for, it should all be a very natural extension of your authentic self. And if you're having to rationalize or explain why you're doing something and it's causing that sort of unnatural feeling, it's probably not a good fit for you. And that, that's something I've experienced in numerous ways over the course of my 13, 14 years of, of work experience. How did you manage to remain persistent during those years when you weren't in the right place. I guess that was one of the things that really impressed me about your story. You talked about this 13 year journey to figure out what you wanted to do. And I know what happens is a lot of times people will give up and they'll just settle. How did you keep that fervor and that interest in trying to find something that wasn't just good enough, but was really great for you? I think this is one of those times where being a little stubborn or persistent can certainly work to your advantage instead of to your detriment. Uh -huh. I think that for me, I knew there were these times in my life where everything was flowing. You know, it's that whole you're in the zone kind of feeling. And there were moments throughout my career which I could directly point to. And I had worked with an executive coach on two separate occasions, and they both helped me to think through sort of what these experiences had in common. I was teaching people, I was working to introduce people to one another or to knowledge. I was solving problems, or I was trying to take something complex and simplify it for a large group of people. Starting to recognize that, I knew there was something out there that would be a better fit. 
maybe not in every dimension, whether it was commute or people I worked with or the type of product or service we were selling, but I, I kind of knew that at some point I'd find a better fit, not sort of the ideal or dream job concept. It was just sort of this blind faith that there was going to be a better opportunity that kind of kept me in the game. And I tried to, to take it in pieces. So as I worked in consulting and I knew I wanted to be more in the HR talent acquisition world, I would go to events. I would meet people. Uh, I would pick brains and invite people out for coffee saying, hey, I'd love to learn more about how you do university recruiting or how you do executive search or how this uh, applicant tracking system is implemented. And each interaction that I set up would get me closer to understanding, oh, I like this, or mm, maybe I don't want to deal with HR information systems or compensation and benefits. But just having those conversations, again, helped me to refine those moments where I felt like I was in the groove or if I needed to back away and just not even touch. It sounds like one of the themes that's coming up from today is that your connections worked really well for you, either uncovering opportunities or helping to enlighten you or inform you about something that you didn't know about. And I've met you before, and I know you're a very personable guy, and I would describe you as someone who is definitely a connector. For people out there who maybe aren't as comfortable with networking or they haven't bought into the idea of networking, is there something that you've learned through that process of doing quite a bit of connecting with other people that you think would be useful? Yeah, actually. So, you know, my wife is a classic introvert and I'm a classic extrovert. So we talked about this at length about how she can get connected to people. And I think you have to, to work with what you're strongest at. So, you know, if you're not comfortable going to a group networking event, but let's say you have a friend who loves to connect people, maybe ask that person one-on-one, -on -one, say, hey, would you mind coming with me to this event? Would you mind introducing me? Or keep it very much targeted and say, hey, would you mind introducing me to this one person so I can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation? What I've learned is that if you ask someone for help, more often than not, they will say yes. And you know, if you just ask them for their story or something that's uniquely theirs, I think people are very willing to share that with people because they've all been in the situation before where they're trying to make a transition happen or they're trying to learn about how to get to the next opportunity. So figure out what you're comfortable with and, and, and work on that. And then figure out, is there a path that someone else can help you with? The right introduction. Even again, just telling their story. Like I would meet with people who worked across all these different parts of the HR world. And every time I meet with someone, I say, just, can you just tell me how you got here? Keep some of the questions consistent, you know, learn about what the differences and similarities are. And it kind of helps you build uh, your own narrative for you to follow. It's hard to ask for help, but if you're willing to sort of put your ego on hold for a conversation, I think it will bear a tremendous relationship and, and create a really good opportunity for you. The other thing that I'm curious about is having been through this career change, what's one thing that you've learned along the way? The most important thing for career change is you have to be particularly self-aware about who you are, what you do well, and realistically where you can spend your time. I've had a lot of coaches, you know, or guidance, you know, or, you know counselors or people in the past and when I say, you know, you can't always take a, a weakness and turn it into a strength. And I really believe that. I think that you have to focus, again, on the things that make you you, and you can't really break certain things that you've learned over the course of your life. So for me, that was just, I'm going to keep being a connector. I'm going to keep leaning on some of my strengths. But at the same time, I, I try to figure out what are my vulnerabilities? What are the things that I'm not aware of that are blind spots? And I got that through my executive coaching. When I first started the business school, we did something called the Hogan Assessment, which is a very comprehensive analysis of some of your strengths and values and blind spots and risks. I also did a 360 assessment feedback survey. And these all kind of fed into this perspective of how I was being perceived by friends or customers or bosses. And there were a lot of those moments where I got a real kick in the head with someone saying, hey, I think you're actually pretty weak at something. One example, it was a, you know, how I thought I was being perceived as contributing to the team. And I thought I was pretty strong. And the feedback was, you're actually weak slash middle of the pack. And feedback, I think, can be the best thing in the world if you're willing to take it. Because if you're willing to take it, you can figure out how do I improve? How do I change if I need to? And being receptive to feedback, I think, is the only thing that's allowed me to, to make the transitions that I've made over the last five years. 
And how have you gone about finding people to give you that kind of feedback? Because I definitely agree. I think getting some candid feedback can be really, really educational. And one of the questions I get asked a lot is, how can you find a mentor or how do you find the right person to give you this kind of feedback on who you are and what you're good at and what you're not so good at? I guess I would look at three kind of distinct sources of feedback. One is like the people who are closest to you who can be honest and direct with you and you will take their feedback because you trust them and then you have an established relationship. The second group would be people not necessarily in your friend circle, but who would be doing the jobs that you're looking to do. For me, that was some of my peers who went to business school who were in the jobs at you know Deloitte Consulting where I was looking to apply. And I would ask them very candid feedback. Like, if you look at my resume, my experience, do you think I'd be a good fit? And then the last group would be a more senior leadership kind of perspective. In this case, it was that director at Deloitte who could see what career progression had been like for her and for others and knew a little bit about my background to say, yeah, I think you would be a good fit because of X, Y, and Z. And so all those kind of different sources of feedback kind of allowed me to figure out what things I needed to improve upon and how I'd go about doing it. Again, because each of these three sources is so different, you're going to get very different responses. So that is a great segue into the last thing I want to talk about before we wrap up, which I uh, can't let you get away without talking a little bit about LinkedIn and the power of LinkedIn and how LinkedIn can serve as a tool that allows you to reach out to some of these people you're talking about in your professional network, whether it's peers or people who are more senior. And I was just wondering if you might be willing to share one or two tips on maybe some less obvious ways that people can leverage the power of LinkedIn. I work a lot with companies on their talent brand, which leads me to think a lot about how individuals should present their own talent brand. They're the basics, right? There's your photo, there's your summary, there's your education and experience and your skills, which I think is is pretty important, but it doesn't always set you apart from everyone else. I think there's a couple of things that can make LinkedIn a really helpful tool for anyone who's trying to make a career switch. The first of which is posts. So for example, if you look back at my posting history, I started posting articles about some of the dynamics between applicants and hiring managers, other topics that I was really passionate about. To be honest, I didn't get a lot of traction or a lot of uh, engagement, but I was trying to put out there that I was deeply passionate about these topics, and people can see that my interest goes back several years. On top of that, as you're trying to figure out who you're connecting with and why you should connect with them, I tell people, don't go straight after the hiring manager. I think if you begin to build your network with people within an organization, it could be different functions, it could be on the team you're looking at, it allows you to create this portrait of what it's like to work at a company. And I think that that's the best thing that LinkedIn is, can be used for is just to help you build that perspective. Use network, see who you know there, ask them for advice, ask them for half an hour to do coffee, tell people never ask them for a job because that's really not fair to put that kind of onus or responsibility onto someone you barely know or even your friends. But if you just build up your knowledge of a company's culture, I think that will help set you apart when you're finally ready to pull the trigger on on making a career shift. And is there a particular function in LinkedIn that you think you just consistently see people overlooking or maybe it's like an untapped resource within the platform of LinkedIn? One of the features that came out uh, last year or earlier this year was uh, open candidates. So you can essentially indicate to recruiters that you're open to a conversation. Now, for some people that could be preaching to the choir because they've already done it, they've already started that search process. But for those who haven't, I think it's a great way to say, hey, I'm open to a conversation. If you've done that, if you've started making your outreach to people who are outside your direct uh, network of, of connections, then I think it's only a matter of time before you find the right contact, find the right company, and then ultimately get that career switch that you've been anchoring for. Great. Well, that's a helpful tip because I can tell you I wasn't aware of that function until recently myself. So we'll try to include a link to the instructions on how you let recruiters know that you're open to opportunities in the show notes. So I'd love to wrap up, Aaron, by talking about something that goes beyond the boundaries of work that I know you're really passionate about, which is travel. And I know this is a really important part of your passions. And I was wondering if you could just tell me a little bit more about your blog, Go to See the World, and what inspired you to invest time in creating this blog? 
So, you know, I'm the son and grandson of travel agents. Uh, my grandmother founded uh, her travel agency in San Francisco's Chinatown over 50 years ago. My mother took it on. The hardest thing for me was I got to travel the world by virtue of work or because of play. And my mom, the travel agent, couldn't travel because she was a paraplegic. And so life, kind of one of life's cruel little twists that the travel agent couldn't travel herself. So I started this blog about two and a half years ago so that she could come on my journeys with me and experience all the different countries that I was trying to visit. And unfortunately, I lost my mom last year to cancer. And so the project has kind of taken on a very special meaning to me because I know that if, if she had been able to travel, that she and I would have gone to a lot of these places together. I just turned 35 a few months ago and I'm at 36 countries. So I've set a goal of myself of getting to 100 countries by the time I'm 45. So apparently I've got you know, my work cut out for me, but uh, <laughs> something that I just, I, I love to travel. I live to travel. And in fact, I'm even doing this interview from a hotel in Dallas. It's, that's probably a sign of how much I love to travel. Yeah, that's great. And what are the sort of things you like writing about in the blog? Whenever I go places, I, I love three things. I love food. Uh, I love oh, meeting yeah, me new too. people. And I love seeing the sites and being able to tell people about what to do next. And this is probably, you know, a sign that I, you know, I'm, in a travel family, but every time friends are going to a different country or a different city, there's usually a ping saying, hey, what should I do there? And I always keep a running list of, you know, where do you eat? Where do you grab a cocktail? Where should you stay? What kind of museum should you see? It comes very naturally to me. And it's, you know, if I didn't have to work, I would absolutely be traveling just all the time. That's very cool. And I also think it's just a really wonderful way to honor the memory of your mother. So I think it's great you're doing that. If people want to check out your blog or if they want to learn more about you or get in touch with you, where can they go? If they want to go to the travel blog, it's www.aaronfung.me. Uh, you can always find me on LinkedIn. If people have questions about travel or career changes, I'm happy to help wherever I can. Well, thanks so much, Aaron, for talking with me today. I know it's been a few years since we've seen each other in person, so it's been really cool to reconnect. And I just really found it useful to hear about your thoughts on the power of candid feedback and why nurturing relationships, even the weaker ones, is so important. A few tips on LinkedIn. And also very interesting to hear about your travel blog. You'll definitely have to let me know when you come out to London and we'll try to meet up and find a couple places to eat. That sounds perfect, Joseph. So I hope you enjoyed hearing Aaron's thoughts on the importance of getting feedback, the power of even weak connections in your life, and how work should be a natural extension of your authentic self. Now it's time to wrap up with today's Mental Fuel, where I'm going to talk about how I maintain my professional network, which has helped open doors in my own career. Before we get to today's Mental Fuel, I wanted to thank Brand Yourself for supporting this episode of Career Relaunch. Brand Yourself offers simple tools and services to help control what people find when they Google you. To clean up, protect, and improve how you look online, visit brandyourself.com and use promo code RELAUNCH to get 50% off a premium membership. This is the part of the show called Mental Fuel, where I finish the show with a brief personal story related to one of the topics we covered today and wrap up with a simple challenge to help you move forward with your own career goals. So for today's Mental Fuel, since one of the themes I heard from Aaron was about the importance of building your network, I thought I'd share a couple stories of how my professional network has served me in my own career. And since we've been talking about LinkedIn, one of the simple routines I follow to build and maintain my own network. I want to start by saying I'm a huge believer in networking. Connecting with others has allowed me to learn a lot, expand my professional community, share information, and has definitely opened up a few job opportunities for me. And on that last point, when I think about the four ways I've applied to jobs through job boards, directly in response to a company job advertisement, working with a recruiter, or through networking, networking has consistently been the most effective for me. And when I ask people in my workshop audiences how they found their jobs, Networking is also consistently the most common way. So most of the jobs I've landed in my career have come from networking. One example was when I first moved to Hawaii just after college when I had no real work experience yet. And an alumni I reached out to from my university introduced me to someone she knew at Hawaii Public Radio. And meeting with him was how I eventually landed my job there as a news anchor. Another example was when I was working in San Francisco and I met with a colleague's friend in London before I moved to the UK, who over a year later helped me get my resume into the hands of the right hiring manager at Goo, where I eventually worked. And even now, pretty much every 
every single one of my paid speaking engagements has come from someone I've met at an event or through some sort of a contact. So I'm a big believer in networking, and I actually now run networking workshops for groups, and one of the concepts I talk about is the three types of networking contacts out there. The cold contacts, with whom you have zero ongoing contact, the warm contacts, who are the people you're in touch with regularly, and the hot contacts, where someone's actively helping you or you're actively helping them with something. And in my workshops, I talk about how hard it is to have a cold contact become a hot contact, which is why you need to make sure you keep the contacts in your network warm. So one of the most common questions I get is how you can keep your network warm. The only way I've been able to consistently do this is to create a routine for myself so this pretty much becomes a habit. So we're talking about LinkedIn today, and one simple way I've created a habit around keeping my network warm is to make use of LinkedIn's email network updates. By turning on the weekly digest, I get emails that notify me when my connections have a new position, hit a work anniversary, or even appear in the news. Then if I see an interesting piece of news about a contact I've not connected with in a while, I'll just take a few minutes to send them a quick email to say congratulations and share a quick update on what I'm up to. That's it. Now, when I do this, sometimes people write back, but honestly, sometimes they don't. Sometimes it leads to us reconnecting, and sometimes it doesn't. And I'd say most of the time, we end up just exchanging a few pleasantries. But every so often, it actually does lead to an opportunity, not even one I was necessarily seeking out to begin with. So even though keeping your network warm doesn't always amount to anything in the near term, you just really never know how things are going to pan out. In my own career, sometimes an opportunity has come from a cold contact I've reached out to for the first time, but more often, the best opportunities have come from a result of a series of efforts I've made to stay in touch with someone over a long period of time, sometimes years, in ways I could have never predicted or engineered even if I'd wanted to. So take a moment now and think about your own career. How did you land your last role? Where have your best opportunities come from? I'd be willing to bet that at least a couple of them have come through a strong professional relationship or friendship you've developed maybe when you least expected it. This takes me to a quote from Reid Hoffman, who fittingly is the co-founder of LinkedIn. One of the challenges in networking is everybody thinks it's making cold calls to strangers. Actually, it's the people who already have strong trust relationships with you, who know you're dedicated, smart, a team player, who can help you. So my challenge to you is to build a simple ritual into your week that makes it easier for you to get in the habit of keeping your contacts warm. For example, if you're interested in turning on those LinkedIn email notifications like I do, I've included a link in the show notes that tells you exactly how you can do that at careerrelaunch.net slash 35. Before we wrap up, I just wanted to thank the user called Inspired Artist in Canada for leaving this positive review for Career Relaunch on Apple Podcasts. She wrote, I love listening to Career Relaunch, as I get to hear from a variety of people who all share a common thread of making their life what they want. I feel super inspired and love how people are creating their own career path and life. Well, Inspired Artist, I'm so happy to hear you're gaining some inspiration from this show, and I really do try to feature a wide range of people, so I'm glad you enjoy hearing their stories. Now, if you want to share some feedback on the show, I'd love for you to leave me an Apple podcast review at careerrelaunch.net slash review. It only takes a couple minutes and it really helps this show reach more listeners like you. Again, that's careerrelaunch.net slash review. So we've been talking all about networking, and if you want to add one more person to your professional network, I always enjoy hearing from listeners, and I'd definitely welcome you connecting with me or following me on LinkedIn, where I share more of my thoughts and articles on career change. Just go to LinkedIn and search for Joseph Liu, and you should be able to find me there. Today, we've also talked about specific ways you can tap into a few networking tools on LinkedIn, so you can find a summary of all those tactics and relevant links at careerrelaunch.net slash 35. Also, most of the people I feature on this show have come from my own network, but I'm always looking for people with inspiring career change stories to feature on this show. So if there's someone in your network who has made a unique career pivot, or if you would like to share your own career change story on the show, you can apply to be a guest at careerrelaunch.net slash apply. 
Thanks so much for being part of the Career Relaunch community and a special thanks again to Aaron Fung for sharing his story with us today. This episode was mixed by Richard Pennington. Electrocardiogram wrote and performed our original theme song. Stay tuned for the next episode where I'll be featuring a former circus stage manager who's now a full-time voiceover artist. I'm Joseph Liu and I'll see you then.